I recently learned the concept of a walk-in song. I think it started with baseball, you know, that you, ha you have the, the music coming in. So I've decided that mine is Let's Get It Started in Here by the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> Anybody else have one? Yeah, that works. I'll throw you a softball. You can do Eye of the Tiger. That's not mine. Mine is that Taylor Swift song where she goes, it's me, I'm the problem, it's me. That's, that's my, uh, you, you my walk-in song. I, I got to say. So thank my you my for wife gave me that one. <laughs> thank you for joining us on Thursday afternoon of reInvent, no less. We appreciate it. And guess what? We're not going to talk about AI. <laughs> Although I consider myself an early adopter because I loved Clippy. Do y'all remember Clippy? Surely somebody does. <laughs> Irritating AF, but just, I love Clippy. <laughs> but with that said, um, Ben and I are here to talk about product management and how at Amazon we use product centricity to drive innovation. I'm Kristen Johnson. I'm based out of our Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, well, I guess it's not an office because I'm at home. My, <laughs> my office out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And I started my journey with Amazon on the Amazon.com side leading strategy for digital comics and Kindle. And I'm a card-carrying comic book geek. I've been reading comics since I learned how to read, and I still dress up as superheroes and villains. So it was a great chance to see an industry that I loved. So I was right in the heart of Amazon's product management. And I came over to AWS a couple years ago to help our customers to innovate like Amazon. Exactly right, and hello, good afternoon. Uh, raise your hand if your lips are as chapped as mine are right now. I've spent the whole week in the desert, and I'm str it's struggle city right now. So if, uh, if I go to the water a lot, that, that's why. Uh, super happy to be here with you. I gather if you're in this session on a Thursday afternoon that you're a hardcore product management nerd like myself, so we're <laughs> among friends here. Uh, my name is Ben McKeel. I'm based in our Boston office, uh, supporting customers kind of all over the place. Uh, I've been in product management for over a decade, kind of came up through marketing and analytics and, and work sort of across industry. My main goal in life is, uh, is to use product management as a tool to help be build better products and services uh, on the cloud. Um, so for me, product management is super exciting. It's not a settled science. Uh, we really get to, to, uh, to mold it and to use it to, to really drive those experiences and use all that, those, that cool technology at the end of the day. So. I was a little nervous that you were going to say you really wanted to apply product management to your home life. No, And I was going to no. immediately call your wife about that. No. So now you know a little bit about us, we want to know a little bit about you. If you can read the screen. All right, we've got, some, we've got some thumbs up for Star Wars. Can anybody actually do this Spock thingy? Anybody not a sci-fi fan at all? Fair enough. OK, that, that gives us a little bit a lay, of, <laughs> lay of the land here. So we're going to talk about the way that Amazon does product management and innovation. That doesn't mean that we do it the best way. That doesn't mean that it is what your organization needs to adopt. In fact, we can probably learn from you. As, as Ben said, product management is both an art and a science, so we can learn from you too. But we've just been asked about our practices, which is why we are here today. Now, you might be wondering, Kristen, why is there a photo of Josie and the Pussycats on the screen when we are at an IT convention? Hi. Oh, you're just in time for my story. I love it. <laughs> That, that is indeed me in the middle. I, I promise that this, this comes back to product management. That is me in the middle. And several years ago, well before I joined Amazon, two friends and I wanted to dress up for uh, Free Comic Book Day. It's the first uh, Saturday of every May at your local comic book store. And we wanted to do the old school Josie and the Pussycats, like when you could still walk into the grocery store and buy Archie Comics, which you can't do anymore. And so I made our costumes. And being an early prime adopter, on Wednesday, I ordered a drum set to be delivered on Friday so that we could go to the event on Saturday. On Friday, this big box arrives, this big box. And it was like, have any of you seen those YouTube videos where they're unboxing and they're throwing packing peanuts? That was me, and I had my hot pink paint, and I was ready to go. And I opened the box to find a tuba. Now. I don't know what the hell, heck, sorry, we're recording this, right? <laughs> what the heck that happened in the background? <laughs> then I ended up with a tuba rather than a drum set. But as you can imagine, I was quite distraught. So I got online with a customer service rep, who I'm sure thought I was crazy. Oh, my friends are counting on me. I got this tuba. I don't know what I'm going to do. And honest to goodness, that customer service rep called the local guitar center in Charlotte and had a drum set of equivalent value delivered to me in a couple hours. 
This was well before Amazon Fresh. And to be clear, <laughs> disclaimer, I, I don't know if the customer service rep was supposed to do that or whether we still do things like that. But as you can imagine, it left an indelible impression on me that when we say we want to be Earth's most customer-centric company, we mean it. <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> just to close out the story, the question remains, of course, what did you do with the tuba? So I got back online, what do I do with the tuba? And they said, keep it. So I donated it to uh, a local middle school band. Just because we have these fabulous chap lips, why don't you cover our four pillars? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that our product management approach doesn't sit off on an island, right? Everything we do at Amazon, including product management, sits on top of what we call our culture of innovation. Our culture of innovation has four pillars. There's the culture, which is our customer obsession that, that Kristen talked about. It's who we hire and kind of the belief system that we imbue them with. There's the mechanisms. So how you actually uh, uh, encode behavior, how you actually get them to do things, like sort of think of it as a self-reinforcing process that gets better as it goes. Uh, then there's the architecture. So you've got the culture, right? You have people who are super excited to improve the customer experience. You've got the processes correct. They know how to do that. And we'll talk, Kristen actually will talk a little bit about um, our product management, our, our innovation approach, our innovation mechanism. It's called working backwards. Some of you have probably heard of it before. Um, then you need the architecture, the technical infrastructure to actually help support that. If you get people all fired up about customers, and then you give them a process to follow to build product, and then they have to wait for six months to get a server, or you stand up a process where there's an innovation committee that meets once a year, and the ROI that you have to approve before you've ever built anything to get any dollars is like 10 million, um, you're not e enabling your, your company to move quickly. We La call this drinking our own champagne. That's right. Isn't that a better phrase than eating your own dog food? <laughs> And then the last part is organization, right? And, and, and organization is, uh, in short, small, empowered teams that own what they build. Uh, you know, we don't have teams that just build cool stuff and like other teams that just maintain all the garbage, right? Like we, we have teams that own the product from soup to nuts. They are as small as possible, focused on a particular customer. They try to learn about what that customer uh, wants. And then they, they try to iterate and experiment as quickly as possible. So quick, quick poll of the audience. How many of you, first of all, I'm interested, how many kind of like product people do we have in the crowd? How many sort of product owners, managers, people who manage product nice. owners? Okay, cool. How many uh, developers, engineers, SREs, folks like that do we have in the crowd? Okay, great. What about sort of UX folks or customer experience, anybody like that, analytics? Excellent, okay, awesome. Um, so I really, Boy, we, we really, could start a company. Yeah, we could. We've got all yeah, the skills. Yeah, exactly. Um, so getting these four pieces to work together is gonna be really critical. Um, and what I would ask yourself is, Actually, let's do another poll. How many of you ran more than, what month are we in? November, right? Well, we're almost in December, right? Yeah, so let's take November. How many of you ran uh, 100 experiments in November? Bueller? No. 50? 20? Hey, okay, 10? How many of you ran zero experiments in November? We're okay. not trying to put you on the spot. No, 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 not at all. But that, so a key part of our product management approach is experimentation and trying to figure out what customers want. So we like to say that we're stubborn on the vision but flexible on the details to get us there. And we work with customers all the time to sort of try to get their innovation machines unblocked so they can move more quickly. And it's usually one of these four things. Usually one of these four things is missing in your approach. So that's a good kind of thought experiment you can run. And so product management spans a couple of these. It is a mechanism that we use with organization wrapped around it to drive innovation for customers. And so we're gonna cover how we focus on products, like what do we mean when we say product, which given all the hands for product folks out there, you may have a different definition, and I'd love to chat over a cocktail later. Um, but how we look at products, you know, how we organize, and how we innovate at speed. So why products and why, Kristen, did you bother telling that Josie and the Pussycat story? <laughs> because you can't define products without understanding the person who is going to consume, purchase, use, whatever, the customer. And customer is a gen generic term, right? Like if you're a nonprofit, your customer might be members, for example. But whoever is going to use the product. And so using product teams, which we will spend more time on, means that you can move really quickly because it's a small team, which means that you can experiment and iterate. You can try things over and over. One of the two pizza teams, that's a foreshadowing, who worked for me in Kindle 
owned our Comixology Unlimited subscription as a product. And because of these small teams and because of the architecture, they were able to test a, a gift certificate of this subscription in a matter of hours in real customer hands. So small teams, the right tools, moves you can mean fast, you can move fast, you can experiment, you know more about your customer, and when you know more about your customer, you can actually create differentiated products for them. And uh, this, is, this is an example. So we think about Amazon. How many of you are Prime members? I, I don't get incented on that, so I'm uh, just curious. Thank you for your business. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, yes, thank you. We look at that Prime subscription as a product. And so as you look at the things that have been added to your membership, there have been different features. This is a good representation of a product roadmap, considering that subscription as a product. But as Ben and I have talked about, this looks really linear and perfect, but because of all the experimentation, there's things that kind of drop off along the way, get added, et cetera. So, like Prime Wardrobe, did any of you try Prime Wardrobe? Yeah, a couple of hands. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, sad to say, it, it no longer exists. <laughs> it and Echo Look, did anybody use the Echo Look? So the Echo Look, I'll be honest, is a little creepy. <laughs> which maybe that's why it didn't survive. It was, a, it was a camera powered by Alexa technology that would take photos of you head to toe so you could see how you looked in whatever outfit. It was like, do y'all remember Clueless? <laughs> Cher's closet, she had that, that computer machine that matched things. I mean, you could literally, on Echo Look, you could add two photos and ask, you know, which one of these looks better on me, which saved my husband a hell of a lot of work in there. But both of those features of Prime subscription have been discontinued in honor of try before you buy, which is, you know, you can, buy, you can, you can have something delivered, try it for seven days, and return it without paying for it. Why don't you talk about our other products, Ben? Yeah, so the question that we get a lot is, is what is a product? And when people think of products, they typically think of like hardware or, you know, big obvious products like Prime. But a key takeaway I think here, and again, we kind of have two goals for today. We didn't really say that, but our, you know, we have two goals. One goal is to be a little bit inspirational, to give you some inspiration, some big ideas that you might want to think about. The second thing, though, is to give you some tactical things that you can go try out tomorrow in your own approach as you sort of experiment to your own definition of what product management is. So the takeaway on this is, is to think about products less about like specific hardware devices. Sure, the hardware devices are products, but pretty much everything at Amazon is a product. So our contact center is a product. Oh, so you go, can you go back one? Oh, sure, sorry. So our, our, our Amazon Connect contact center is a product. Our Amazon Go stores, where you can just walk in, pick up whatever you want, and walk out, that's managed as a product. All of our programs and internal services are managed as products. Uh, with all of the same mechanisms, all, they, they all build product in the same way, and they all have a lot of the same metrics, like a lot of the, the approach to how they manage these things is the same, whether it's hardware, software, a program, or something else. So a case in point, uh, all of you hopefully are familiar with a page that looks sort of like this. Um, and you, know, you might look at this and say, well, how many products is this? Uh, and the answer is a lot. Um, there are over 300 APIs that are just visible on this page right now. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of teams that are involved in this. If you think back to our culture mechanisms, architecture and organizations framework, the architecture required to actually do this has to be very decoupled and nimble, right? You need to be able to deploy this without being super connected to everything else that's in the stack. So last year, I, th I think we deployed something like 20 million times. Uh, and if you think about those 20 million deploys, and those can be super tiny, obviously, they're not all, they're actually, most of them are not big bangs. That's 20 million opportunities, 20 million data opportunities we had to create data points to learn more about our customers and to refine things. But these teams are not banging into each other. So for example, you have a team that owns the adaptive homepage. How do all these pieces fit together, right? And then within the, within the um, page itself, you have all these other components, right? You've got the cart, you've got search, which is its own product, you've got all these asset, uh, boxes, you've got the items, you've got, um, what else, the account, all the preferences, promotions, and so on and so forth. And all of these folks are focused on a specific customer and a specific customer need, and they're all iterating towards uh, their own goals, and they all come together in sort of a beautiful symphony most of the time uh, to, to, to drive a larger and better customer experience. But we don't limit the ability of the team that runs the search function by telling them that they can't do something until the cart team has something else figured out, right? And this is, again, an illustrative illustration. There are many, many sub-teams under these broader uh, teams. Yeah. 
which kind of sounds like organized chaos. It is. It 100% <laughs> you think about it, is, yeah. Maybe it's chaos by design. Part of the way that we manage our product portfolio is with a product taxonomy. Those of you that are, are product folks, have you worked with a taxonomy? It's, it's so, so it's really, it, it, it's a framework that allows you to keep track of all of those products at the lowest measurable level. So at Amazon.com in particular, we think about that as the skew, right? The lowest possible level that you can measure, particularly around ROI. So this becomes very much a portfolio management input because it shows you where you might be spending too much on a widget that's applicable other places. I worked with, a, with one of our, our customers to design this for their organization. Big transportation company had three different types of transportation. So barge, train, and freight. Trucks are freight, right? That's what they're called? Yeah. And so they broke down, this is the IT organization, so their customer were the internal employees and their products were all the things that they provided for those internal employees. And when they really broke it down and they kind of went from the very top and kept breaking down and looking at what could be defined as a product through this taxonomy, they found that the bill of lading for barges was inordinately expensive to maintain and didn't add a lot of differentiation. So because they could see that low level of ROI, they were able to discontinue that widget and just use the widgets from the other, uh, the other types of transportation. <laughs> but it's not just about putting, your, you know, putting a stake in the sand and saying, this is a product. We're going to make you a product then. <laughs> this is a product. I think it time to retire me. <laughs> oh, never. Um, it's, it's, you need more than just defining something as a product. You need to wrap it with supportive structures, so to speak. And part of the reason is because product life cycles are still changing. Historically, so if you took this in university and you looked at pro product life cycles, they were very much like, I call this the stegosaurus model. You know, they kind of had a slow ramp up. They had kind of an extended peak and then a slow tail end. Well. Anymore today, the product life cycle is more like a shark fin. And I'll resist the urge to sing the baby shark song to you because then it'll be stuck in your head all the way home. But the, uh, the, the, here's an example. Several years ago, a game called Draw Something came out. Did anybody use that? It was a, it was, you, could, you could draw something and, and send, it, send it to a friend. Wildly popular. It was launched in February and had, I think, 20 million users in less than a month. So a big video game company bought them for $108 million. Guess what? Their users peaked on that day. February launched, purchased in March by May. They were in half to 10 million customers. So with the instant gratification of consumers today, keeping in mind that life cycles can be very quick and very short, so we have other things to wrap around it. And Ben's going to cover some of the organization. Yeah, I think the key mental model for, for what Kristen was talking about is the importance of speed, right? Like a lot of companies make high quality decisions. Um, we try to make high quality but also high velocity decisions. So the implication of that last slide is in some markets and for particular most customers, honestly, if you're late, that's, that's you know, you, you've missed the, you've missed you've the missed boat. And, and, you know, raise your hand if your expectations of companies today are higher than they were five years ago. Right? Like, and I think your customers are the same. Nobody is, you know, the, the world is just getting faster and expectations are getting higher. I get annoyed with like my local tax authority when I can't pay my property tax bill online. I'm outraged. Whereas like beforehand, it would have been, you know, like I think that was just routinely accepted. Um, all right, so we talked a little bit about our mental models and, and the importance of speed and the importance of experimentation, obviously the importance of customer centricity. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we actually organize and we'll start off with the role of the product owner. Uh, this next slide is my favorite slide in the deck, so please laugh. Um, I show this not only as like, and I'm not wearing, I'm wearing sort of trendy socks today. The shoes I think are kind of trendy, but um, I show this all to be funny, but also to make an important point, which is when you're hiring for product owners, please over index for having a sense of humor, okay? <laughs> There is nothing worse than having like a humorless product manager who thinks of themselves as like the CEO of the product and runs around with a clipboard annoying everyone, right? Like you want people who really <laughs> love product management and are not in this for the wrong reasons. Um, all right, so the cool part about this, again, like I said, is it's not a settled science. 
If you ask our friends in Menlo Park, our friends across the pond in, in, in Seattle and Bellevue what a product manager is, you might get a definition that's different than our definition. Never mind uh, if you ask somebody who you know, works for JP Morgan or, or something like that. Our friends on Wall Street also have a slightly different definition. But this is our definition, and I'm gonna read it because I actually think the words are kind of important, and I know the folks in the back are probably not gonna be able to read it entirely. So, product managers are responsible for developing inspiring product visions derived from identifying customer needs, market opportunities, and technology trends that drive innovative and differentiated product strategy. Product managers define customer experiences in the form of features and functions and drive the product roadmap to meet the defined vision. Product managers identify and measure product and business metrics to increase adoption and understand their customers' ongoing needs. And the last sentence I think is the most important, at least for us it is. They are the voice of the customer and accountable for the business. Not just one, but both together uh, in, in balance. And so uh, we get a question a lot, it's like where do we get it, product managers from? Where do they come from? I think one of the coolest thing about this business or about being in product is that successful product managers can come from everywhere. If you have the right amount of customer centricity, you're a little bit scrappy, you're curious, you love to learn, and you like working in a team environment, I think it's one of the best jobs that there is. Um, you can be, a, you can be a, an engineer, an application developer, and get into product management. You can be a PhD, a researcher. Yeah, you can fun be... fact, that one's me. Yeah, yeah I, I, always, uh, I always observe here that uh, it's a little concerning that both of their non-work interests involve hard alcohol, but uh, I'll just leave that no there. No correlation. I'll, I'll just leave that there. <laughs> it's not the easiest job in the world. Don't get into product management if you, if you want a nice stress-free job, but it, it, is, it is very rewarding. So let's talk about what a product manager actually does at Amazon, right? Uh, and I think it's actually pretty important to define in your own company. Actually, let's, let's take another poll. How many, of you, how many of your companies have a defined definition and like roles and responsibilities that is documented somewhere uh, for what a product manager is supposed to do? Well, okay, pretty good. Awesome, so here's, here's, what our, here's uh, sort of what our product managers do. So first of all, is customer vision and need. There are a lot of functions where the product manager brings the, get, receives the customer vision and need from somebody else. And that somebody else is usually called the business. I actually hate that term, because for me, everybody who's building the product is the business, no matter what hat you're wearing. Um, but at Amazon, we're responsible for the customer vision and, and the need itself. We have to know our customers better than everybody else so that we can invent on their behalf. That is, that is kind of job one of a product owner. The next thing is kind of the bread and butter or sort of the vanilla, meat and potatoes, whatever kind of analogy you want to use. What I'm sure all of your product managers do something like this. This is the, the planning and the development, working with the teams, writing the stories, or helping to write the stories. This is the sort of basic blocking and tackling of being a product manager. Uh, at our company, we also have to, back to the, the, the thing Kristen was talking about um, with the taxonomy, uh, at Amazon, uh, product managers also have to know like what's to the left of them and what's to the right of them. Okay? Even though they're, they're decoupled, we're a very decoupled and decentralized company, they can't operate in a complete silo and they have to have some awareness to how what they're doing ladders up to their single-threaded leader within a given uh, um, product. Um, we haven't talked about it, but uh, people always often ask me, um, Amazon doesn't have a CIO. Amazon also does not have like a head of innovation. Our teams are organized entirely around customer value or customer value streams. So you can think about it as like there's a head of prime and underneath prime there's a bunch of different teams and all the different flavors that are prime. And each of those teams have the, the sort of people that they need in order to make progress against their own, uh, what they're doing. Uh, next part is go to market launch. Our folks are oper like we, we grew up as a retail company, so we're pretty like operations and, and customer centricity and uh, is super embedded in what we do. We have go to market specialists, right? They're awesome, but you don't um, product owners don't hand off that responsibility entirely to some other function, right? It, it the, you know those those folks will advise them and they'll be heavily involved involved in the go to market. Then once something is in market, that's when the real work starts. Okay? We don't have the mentality that we built something perfect, we throw it over the wall, it goes into market, and we move on to the next thing. We want to be stubborn on the vision, but we're going to be flexible on the details, and we need our customers to tell us whether what we did actually solved their problem or not. And you can't do that unless you're operating. 
which means you're, you're measuring, you're adapting, you're experimenting, and you're improving on that product. And then finally, uh, we're also pretty heavily involved in people management and strategy. Um, we're a very decentralized organization, but still, um, product managers at Amazon often go on to become general managers, um, so people management does become more of an of a importance there. One other uh, unsolicited tip on this, if you're building, I, I've built quite a few product management organizations and I've hired a ton of product managers in my life. If you're in the process of doing that, do not create a structure that requires a product manager to hoard other product managers in order to advance their career. <laughs> a lot of companies make the mistake of saying like, well, if you wanna be a product leader, you have to have 15 other product managers reporting to you, and you end up with this really vertical thing uh, that kind of promotes some behaviors, like some real anti-patterns, if you, if you think about the things we've talked about. So try to keep that decentralized structure. In my experience, that's what works best. Um, and think about like how does a product manager advance their career in your company? How do you create that as being a, like a, a desired place to work for product leaders without forcing them to, to hire and, and vertically stack like a bunch of one-to-one -one reporting relationships? I, I, I would add to that is be cautious of taking a project manager yes. and just changing that first description into a, a product manager. Not because the person, I'm not saying that your project managers can't do this role, it's just the measurement, the expectations, the deliverables are very different. And so it can be hard to adapt. So that as well. So, okay, so we have products, we have people around it, and a product manager is, so I, I, I do think of it as somewhat of a P&L owner, not necessarily oh, a sure. CEO, but a P&L owner. And ideally, in a, in a perfect <laughs> ideally, world, yes. ideally. That, that should be the goal, even if it's not always possible on day one. We, we organize and we put product managers with two pizza teams. And two pizza teams are exactly what they sound like. And if you've been working with your AWS team, you're probably familiar with this. It's no team should be larger than can be fed by two pizzas. <laughs> When my husband's teenagers were living with him, I'll tell you that this algorithm totally went out the window. And, you know, we could debate European versus American pizzas, but the theory, the science behind small teams of six to eight people is about moving quickly and having an appropriate cognitive load. So if you look at, let's look at a team of six people and all the cross sections and interaction points. If you do the math, if there's six people, there's about 15 linkages that you have to maintain to have all of them talking to each other. Once you get to 12 people, that jumps to 66. And more and more and more until the links and the ability to maintain those links, uh, it, it, it's just too much of a cognitive load and it exceeds your cognitive capacity. We're also not the first to use small empowered teams. Certainly there's examples of this in the Navy and in other areas, but it is truly how we run our business. These report to a single-threaded leader. They have full empowerment to make decisions around their product roadmap, and they are expected to move quickly, quickly, quickly. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, there, there are downsides to any approach you pick, and you can probably guess what the downside of that approach is that we've been talking about. Uh, the downside primarily is the risk of duplication because you don't have uh, one group that knows everything that's happening within the company. Um, but we're okay with that. We, we have a saying that says two is better than zero. We'd rather have two solutions that are sort of kind of the same uh, that are working for customers than having no solution whatsoever. Which comes back to the taxonomy. Exactly, comes back to the taxonomy and, and leads into single-threaded owners, right? Single-threaded owners that, could, that can kind of have a purview within their domain. All right, so what do these product teams actually look like? Um, hopefully most of you are set up somewhat like this or it's your goal to be set up sort of someone like this. I, more and more companies I work with now are set up in this way where uh, the product managers and the UX or CX folks and the engineers are working together in one team. It's less about this department's over here throwing stuff over the fence and this department just builds what they're told to build. And it, it, I'm really seeing a lot more inter interdisciplinary uh, work together. Um, this is an example of a, one of those front-end widget teams, right? The, the ones that I showed you for the dot-com side. There's a product manager, a UX designer, and specific engineers or technical experts based on the role. If it's a different team, like say, there, say your product is a machine learning algorithm, not like a front-end widget, the team still looks like this, it's just the roles are slightly different. So for example, instead of the UX designer, you might have a research scientist that is like on the cusp of understanding like what's going on with machine learning algorithms, and then your engineers, you, might, you might probably have a few more data 
engineers, and it looks slightly different, but the general uh, form of the team and how they work is the same. And that, by the way, that's within the retail operation, that's within Kindle, that's within, you name the kind of business unit, they all sort of function this way. And when, when later when Kristen talks about working backwards, um, every part of Amazon works that way. So we have a lot of fungibility among our employees. When we move to different departments or different companies altogether, we don't have to relearn everything because the underlying structure is basically the same. Uh, just, uh, I'll point out quickly that each role does not equal a person necessarily. Somebody can serve multiple roles within these teams. So, you know, it's a very fungible kind of startup relationship. Um, so again, Amazon is all about mental models, right? Mechanisms and mental models. I'll cover a couple here. This is, this is the, on the section for me of like, what can you start doing tomorrow? Like, go experiment with these things. They're very low cost ways to kind of uh, experiment. One is tenants. Uh, tenants are simply a set of principles and beliefs that guide decision making. So each team at Amazon has their own tenants. It's usually five to seven sentences that talk about what they value. We value this over this. We prioritize one thing over another. It's, it's kind of like describing how we work. And it's public, so anybody within Amazon, can, if, especially if they want to go join that team, can see like, oh, are, is the stuff that this team is working on interesting for me? Am I going to fit into the culture of this team? Do I find this interesting? Um, I've, I've referenced single-threaded owners a bunch. Wherever possible, we try not to have a product span more than one team. If it starts so you don't have the TPS debacle, the, the TPS a, reports from Office Space. That's exactly. So we try to limit handoffs. We try to keep products within one team. Uh, when the team gets too big, we split them up, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then there's just some, some ways to make a decision, right? So we, we encourage folks to take calculated risks. Uh, we do want to dive deep. And, and then a lot of this uh, um, connects to our leadership principles. So we, we, um, one of our leadership principles is called have backbone, disagree, and commit. The way I describe this is, um, we don't get in a room, uh, I wouldn't say we have a nice culture, and I don't mean that in a bad way because I think Amazon people are super nice, but it's not a consensus driven culture. What I mean is we don't get into a room and have a debate and pick the decision that pisses the least number of people off. <laughs> we get into a room and we all advocate really forcefully for our beliefs and what we want to do, but at the end of the day there's a decision maker and we're expected to disagree, but then also commit to whatever the decision is made. And it's all documented. We're a heavily narrative-driven culture. Uh, we write a lot of documents. We don't do many PowerPoints. It's one of the reasons our slides are so ugly, so please be gentle. <laughs> we realize um, that's ironic. Yeah. Actually, just, just quickly, we're going to show how some of these organization structures yeah. look. But any big burning questions that we can answer now? Ah, how long does the team live was the question. So we would, it depends, we would never set <laughs> Don't up you hate a team. That answer? It's every answer to Amazon is it depends. Um, we would never set up a new team in a domain that we didn't think had at least about an 18 month runway. Um, but some teams live forever. I mean, as long as it's valuable to the customer, we can continue to drive additional value. Some of the teams live for the entirety of, of Amazon, right? And other teams will get wound down. Uh, Kristen gave some examples of products that we thought, you know, the customer need was there, but the way that we decided to solve the problem was suboptimal for whatever reason, so we pivoted. And then those teams would pivot into that new way of Which working. Which doesn't mean that over those 18 months that they have the same product all along the way. If a product, for whatever reason, the experiments are failing, or there's too much on the roadmap and they need to split or something, that team may receive another product to own. So the team remains stable, even if the product doesn't necessarily. Yeah, but the key is to pick, also pick big, interesting things to solve. Like pick big customer pain points to go solve, to where even if you don't solve all of it, you still really delight the customer. We don't pick teeny tiny problems and then spin up a bunch of teams to go tackle those, if that makes sense. Yeah. I have a point of view from Kindle, but I'm. Did, did no, you hear please. The yeah, yeah, I did. The question was, where does QA sit? I think is a function within Amazon. Um, it, it it is a function. I will tell you uh, quite bluntly. In Kindle, it didn't play a big role with our two pizza teams, um, I, just because of the expertise that sat with all the roles that comprised the team. It wasn't necessarily a step. There's also a concern about uh, in, inhibiting speed. So in Kindle, we didn't prominently use any sort of QA functions or roles. Yeah, it's been my experience as well. I think, the, and it also in some cases, not that it isn't a valuable function, we do have it at Amazon, but in some cases, um, QA can, I've seen a lot of organizations where QA sort of covers up other problems, either with code quality or with something about the larger system that requires a ton of QA. So 
Um, it's not a huge part of the way that we do business. Th thank you for the questions, by the way. Ben and I aren't used to this sort of kind of conference room seating. We like to kind of walk the crowd and be up and personal, so thank you for the questions. Do you differentiate between product owners and product owners? Ah, the and great the debate <laughs> out there, right? Um, uh, on the Amazon.com side, no, we do not. We use the term product manager exclusively. Yeah. And uh, we also, by the way, use agile lowercase, not agile uppercase. Correct. We, we, are, we do not adhere to the agile industrial complex, but I won't get on my soapbox about that right in this session. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. Like I've seen in some companies where it's like, oh, the product owners are the people with the scrum teams counting the story points, and the product managers are the strategy people. And we don't agree with the, that decoupling. We need people who can do both. Um, so we tend not to have that structure. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, the question was like, how often do we kind of zig and zag? I, it, it's hard to answer that question in the abstract, but we're, we're stubborn on the vision, but flexible on the details. Like if we can solve your problem with carrier pigeon, we'll do that. Um, we always start, I think it might be a good transition to actually get to, to working backwards, because that I think explains how we sort of frame our product vision and, and how we orient ourselves to it. And trust us, we'd much rather, much rather have these conversations quickly before, they, before we go there. Yeah. Um, oh, let me yeah. cover this one. And yeah, 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 yeah definitely. This comes two. up all the, yeah. So how does this all flow together from an HR kind of reporting structure? So this is, is a very pure sense. So the, 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 the white female figure up there was my role as a portfolio leader with product teams and product managers that reported to me and their teams reported to them as the product manager. The advantage of this is because you have that one boss, you can move quickly, you have all the skills that you need. This is kind of the purest sense of a two pizza team reporting structure. There is a dis disadvantage with this though, and that is if you aren't reporting to somebody in your functional area, you may feel like there's not career progression or opportunities to continuously improve because you don't, you know, the, the, the product manager doesn't necessarily have that skill set. And so we've created communities of practice that are not your old school communities of practice where they're basically just networking and drinks. Boy, I do bring up Those are stuff. fun though, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Those are fun, but that's not what they They have are. deliberate milestones and they have very senior leader sponsors so that if your goal is to be able to continue in your particular functional area, you still have access to all the best practices. Now, we argue, again, in this pure unicorns and roses sense, that an advantage of this reporting structure is that everybody develops T-shaped skills. And what I mean by that is they may have a depth in one area, but they're exposed to all these other skills, which gives you different career paths. So this is what we strive for, particularly when there is something net new. But, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> there are other flavors of this approach. Um, I get this question all the time, and my first answer to this question is usually um, the org chart is less important than you think it is. What's more important is that you get away from a project approach and move to a product approach. The flavor of product organization you choose is dependent on your culture and what you're trying to achieve and who you have and what you want to do. Um, any of these can work. They're all superior, from my perspective, from, uh, to a project-only culture. So the, the model number, and something can still get managed as projects. I'm not trying to disparage project management at all. Um, what I'm saying here, though, is for, for org model number two, most people I know, most companies I work with, don't have enough security people or data scientists to go around. Like, that's a pretty common thing. So with those folks, you create sort of a, you can think of this as like a chapter model uh, where you have, uh, you know, teams sharing certain resources. The key parts of that model is that, um, say it's legal, compliance, data, security, whatever. Um, they are kind of, they're, they're a dotted line to the team. They have to understand the team mission. They have to know what the team's trying to do. They have to, most importantly, understand the team's customer. And then when uh, the team is stuck and needs to get unblocked, there needs to be some sort of a bat phone mechanism. So whatever that person does during their day, their day to day, they need to put that down and help unblock the team before they go back to all the other work that they do. 
So now we've given you Baby Shark and the Batman theme. They can be warring in your head. That's it. And then the third version is what most large companies do. Uh, this model is fine. Uh, essentially, you have the same kind of uh, approach where you have these product teams, and the core unit is still the product team, uh, but you sort of preserve the horizontal HR reporting line. So the product leaders all report to the product, the engineers all report to the head of engineering, the uh, creatives all report to the head of design or creative or whatever. That's fine. Um, this model works fine. The obvious downside to this is that everybody feels like they have seven bosses, uh, and your organization may sometimes unintentionally send mixed messages to these teams, and it might be as simple as you have summer outings, but you organize summer outings by function, and your engineers all go over here, and your product people all go over there. That undoes a lot of goodwill that you're trying to reinforce with your teams about saying, hey, you're all one team, I don't care what hat you're wearing, and like, this is the unit that we care about. This is still a totally fine model, but those are just some, some, some watch outs. All right, uh, other thing is these product teams, to your question, sir, the product teams change and grow over time, and how do you decide when to move them around or when to split them? These are some elements, and they're gonna depend on your industry and like where you are as a team. Uh, one is size. <laughs> I know you all know this already, but just to, again, another, another to remind you and to help you uh, stand up strong to your CEOs, uh, adding more people to the team that will not make the work go faster, it will make the work go slower. So please don't add more people to the team. Uh, second thing is cognitive capacity. If you have a team that's context switching all the time, you, you know that is like the enemy of progress. Um, so you might wanna think about splitting those. Third one is volume. I don't even have to do a poll because I know every single person in here has one team at least that has like a 36 month backlog. Might be time to split that team up. Um, and then there's some other considerations. If a team has kind of been trucking along for a while making incremental improvements and something changes in your world and you need them to think entirely differently and really engage in like step change behavior, might be time to change the team around because that's a hard pivot for most people to make. All right, finally, now how we take, we've talked a little bit about all the products and our taxonomies and how we organize. We've talked about uh, what the role of a product manager and how we sort of uh, fit them together. Now Kristen's gonna talk to us a little bit about how we get that machine moving at speed. <laughs> um, so how many of you have heard or experienced Amazon's working backwards process? And so you'll know working backwards starts with the customer. You identify the customer problem and you work backwards from there to what you are actually going to create to solve that problem. Now, it's pretty similar to, have, have, have any of you been involved in like design thinking or human-centered design? It, it, it has similar principles to that of really hinging on the customer. But what is unique at Amazon are the three artifacts that come out of it. We start with five customer questions. Oh, being very specific about the customer. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> We start with five questions that are working backwards questions. And I'm gonna paraphrase, because you can certainly read this, and it's, it's out there everywhere on the beautiful World Wide Webs. Who is the customer? As specific as possible. So who is the customer? Which is a deceptively simple question with a whole bunch of possible answers. What is their big burning problem? What is the benefit that we can provide to them? So you'll notice we're not talking about cool technology yet. It's all about who is the customer, what is their need, and what is the benefit that we could provide to them to mitigate that pain point. What is the customer experience and how can we get it out there fast, test and iterate so we can provide the benefit more broadly. Out of those five questions, we create three different artifacts. The first is a press release. And so anybody who's in marketing or legal, this doesn't go anywhere, so it doesn't need to be reviewed outside of the business unit. The press release is, however, written like you would send to external media. And it goes through pretty much those five questions. So one of my favorite examples, this is a, this is a fictitious one, is about a dishwasher. So the press release would read something like, gosh, you know, Ben, after hosting people at his house for dinner, has to spend hours picking up the plates, making sure that they are scraped smooth, that the glasses are sanitized. Now, with the dishwasher, Ben can load those dishes and 30 minutes later, they're already clean and sanitized. So that's, that's the flavor of the press release. It's also dated in the future so that you have an idea on when you want to release this benefit to customers. The second artifact are frequently asked questions because 
yes, we can describe the customer experience all day, but you know, Amazon has to think about business realities too. And so the frequently asked questions are where we work through those hows. So there's stakeholder questions and customer questions. The customer questions are things like, I'm a Prime member, do I get this for free? Where do I go if I need help? What if it doesn't work? Versus stakeholder questions, start to look at those realities of what is it gonna cost to build? How long is it going to take? How are you going to experiment and test to make sure that it works? What are the risks and how are you going to mitigate them? And then the one that I love is the Goldilocks question. You know, what else did you consider? We thought about this, we thought about this, but this is why we went this direction with the recommendation. And then so the press release is the what, the FAQs are the how. We cap it off with something that makes my comics loving heart very happy, which is a visual. And the visual is just a checks and balance on a day in the life of a customer experiencing this benefit allows us to double check our thinking, but also to play to different learning styles. Now, um, I get asked a lot about, well, do you have to have a CX person or do you have to have an artist? The answer is no, because it's not about the fidelity of the art. In Kindle, we would literally draw stick figures on a whiteboard. It's about visually expressing the benefit for the customer. All right. Um so we've done all that, we've got our PR FAQ, we've got folks rallied behind the mission, and we wanna start experimenting towards it to see if there's a there there. What do we do, what do we launch? At Amazon, we launch what we call minimum lovable products. Right? So a minimum lovable product is the version of a new product that will generate enough customer enthusiasm, customer delight is the target, right? For the product to rapidly climb up the adoption curve. Remember, remember Kristen's baby shark thing? That's what we're trying to get up, right? If we launch something and our customers are like, this is fine, that's not good enough, we screwed that up. We are looking for signals of customer delight. It can be one customer, it can be half a feature, but it has to delight a customer for us to continue to invest in it and try to, 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 to build on that. Minimum viable product is fine, it's obviously the you know, validated learnings are great, but for us, viability is kind of table stakes. And I mean, I won't, have, I won't make anybody out themselves, but MVP at most companies has devolved into like, what is the, wor <laughs> what is the least like worst, least ugly thing I can put into market uh, to hit some arbitrary deadline that somebody else set for me, right? It's not a, it, it, is, it is in many companies stop being a useful tool. Uh, we always focus on lovability over viability. Um, and that's where the bar is. So we set a really high customer bar. And again, not to disparage, we have deliberately tweaked some of these concepts at Amazon. Like we said right up front, that doesn't mean that it's perfect for your organization. It's just a mind shift, a mental model change. Yep. Um, would you go one more? So um, I also work with a lot of customers and I've lived this myself <laughs> where the product teams, the business, the product teams, the developers, they've I kind of all got the, you know, drank the Kool-Aid, they're all really into this, they're doing these things, they're super agile, they're working for the customer. But the rest of the, you know, whether we want to call it a digital transformation or whatever, pick your, pick your favorite word, the rest of the organization hasn't gotten the memo yet that this is also about them, right? Uh, whether it's HR, whether it's finance, um, whether it's operations, whatever it is, the rest of your company ultimately has to come along for this ride or you're not going to reap the benefits of this model. And the place where this usually lands is in funding. Right, that, that example I talked about earlier, where you have teams that are all fired up, they wanna do things, but there's an innovation committee that meets once a year, and we set budgets for 2025 already. Like, you're never gonna get the, the benefit of this model if you aren't able to release budget sort of on demand, or at least under a single-threaded owner who can put bets into the market uh, behind ideas that she likes. Um, so the way we do funding is a lot like the way a VC might do funding internally. If I have a really good idea, I've landed a PR FAQ and a visual, you know, Kristen's my manager, she's bought in, we've gotten enough support. I might get funding for half a developer and a quarter of a UX resource and I have six weeks to come back with signals of lovability. That doesn't mean I'm gonna build a full product in six weeks. That doesn't mean I'm gonna have an ROI in six weeks, but I need to come back to show that I've cleared that initial hurdle and I can prove that this is lovable by some customer somewhere. Um, if I do that, that's my, angel fund, that's my angel funding. If I do that, then I get my Series A, and we kind of go from there, right? We would never go to a domain. But, you know, I, I see a lot of companies do this. They'll go to a team and be like, you team are the ML team, and you get to do all the ML things. Here's $10 million. We'll come back to you in two years. See, let's see how it goes. I, I'd like that. Yeah, it would be good. Um, so we like to, we, the point is that our, our, we try to um, reduce, um, 
the point of both working backwards and writing in narratives and funding like this is to reduce risk, right? All of us have built something that functionally didn't work and that really sucks. It is way better than building something that is functionally perfect and solves no one's problem. So that's what all of these activities are meant to reduce the risk of happening. Y'all are to appreciate that that batch use is an IT joke. <laughs> All right, another topic that gets a lot of time and attention according to the org chart, including the org chart one, is metrics. What do you measure? What are your metrics? Do you have any magic metrics? We're a heavily data-driven company, but you might be surprised to know that we are specifically trained um, that when anecdotes and metrics differ, that we should believe the anecdotes. Um, and often when anecdotes and metrics differ, it's because you're not measuring the right thing. I don't think we have any magic metrics. We measure all the same things that you all measure. I think what we are good at is being disciplined about choosing the right metric for the right part of the journey. That example I was talking about where I got half a developer and a quarter of a UX person and I'm just trying to get this like little seedling of an idea off the ground even though I think it can be really big. I'm not gonna measure that with the same tools and metrics and numbers that I use to measure my cash cow. Right? Um, so I think we're good at picking the right metric for the right job because what we want to do is to experiment a lot, as Andy said, and not have to live with the collateral damage of the failure of experiments because we're, we're going to fail all the time. It's kind of baked into our process. And, and sometimes we collapse them. So mm -hmm. a lot of times a two pizza team will have what's called a fitness function, which is a calculation of multiple metrics to kind of give a single north star. But again, it varies by what are the customer outcomes that you're trying to drive. All right, so let's, let's recap. We talked a lot about a lot of things. Um, let's bring it all together. So one, our product management approach always has us working backwards from the customer. The cool, we have so much cool technology and we do a lot of cool things with it, but you have to remember that it all started with the working backwards process and a PR AWS. FAQ. AWS, the Go Store, the, the Kindle, like anything you can think of pretty much that you've ever touched from Amazon started out as a document, like we talked about. Andy Jassy wrote the one for AWS. Yes, yes he did. Uh, now, obviously, that one went through a lot of iterations, and it took a while, but, uh, but yes, it started out as a document. Um, two, envision the world as products. Then you want to organize those product teams we talked about, sort of full stack, cross collaborative teams. You bring the work to the teams, you never bring the teams to the work. You want to reduce the risk through iteration and the way you do funding and testing and experimentation. And finally, you want those teams to own the entire life cycle. Teams don't get to just own the part of the code that's cool and new, they have to own all of the code and they have to make decisions, including what tech debt to retire, about where they want to invest their time in order to improve the customer experience. I think this might be the first time that Ben and I have been able to come in a couple minutes under so that we can address some questions. <laughs> so just to wrap this up and then open it up to you, there are other innovation sessions that may be relevant that you want to explore. I think for Thursday, we've pretty much expended them, but we're hoping to repeat all these next year at reInvent, so look for the innovation ones. Also talk to your AWS executives around innovation at Amazon and how we can help take you through the working backwards process. So uh, please, you know, if you want to dive deeper, I'll leave these QR codes up there. We're always looking for feedback as well. Uh, ben and I love to kind of refine our messaging around this, so if you have feedback for us individually, please feel free to share it. Yep. And of course, please complete your session survey.